Suddenly, he heard two voices in rapid conversation. He caught one sentence. Don't lose the key. It was the landlady's voice. The door facing the sea was opened and locked again. Then all was still. Raoul ran back to his room and threw back the window. Christine's white form stood on the deserted quay. The first floor of the setting sun was at no great height, and a tree growing against the wall held out its branches to Raoul's impatient arms and enabled him to climb down unknown to the landlady. Her amazement, therefore, was all the greater when, the next morning, the young man was brought back to her half-frozen, more dead than alive, when she learned that he had been found stretched at full length on the steps of the high altar of the little church. She ran at once to tell Christine, who hurried down, and, with the help of the landlady, did her best to revive him. He soon opened his eyes and was not long in recovering when he saw his friend's charming face leaning over him. A few weeks later, when the tragedy at the opera compelled the intervention of the public prosecutor, Monsieur Mifroy, the commissary of police, examined the Vicomte de Chagny touching the events of the night at Peros. I quote the questions and answers as given in the official report, pages 150 and following. Question. Did Mademoiselle Daye not see you come down from your room by the curious road which you selected? Réponse. No, monsieur, no. Although, when walking behind her, I took no pains to deaden the sound of my footsteps. In fact, I was anxious that she should turn round and see me. I realized that I had no excuse for following her, and this way of spying on her was unworthy of me. But she seemed not to hear me, and acted exactly as though I were not there. She quietly left the key, and then suddenly walked quickly up the road. The church clock had struck a quarter to twelve, and I thought that this must have made her hurry, for she began to run and continued hastening until she came to the church. Question. Was the gate open? Réponse. Yes, monsieur, and this surprised me, but it did not seem to surprise Mademoiselle Daye. Question. Was there no one in the churchyard? Réponse. I did not see anyone, and if there had been, I must have seen him. The moon was shining on the snow and made the night quite light. Question. Was it possible for anyone to hide behind the tombstones? Réponse. No, monsieur. They were quite small, poor tombstones, partly hidden under the snow, with their crosses just above the level of the ground. The only shadows were those of the crosses and ourselves. The church stood out quite brightly. I never saw so clear a night. It was very fine and cold, and one could see everything. Question. Are you at all superstitious? Réponse. No, monsieur, I am a practicing Catholic. Question. In what condition of mind were you? Réponse. Very healthy and peaceful, I assure you. Mademoiselle Daye's curious action in going out at that hour had worried me at first, but as soon as I saw her go to the churchyard, I thought that she meant to fulfill some pious duty on her father's grave, and I considered this so natural that I recovered all my calmness. I was only surprised that she had not heard me walking behind her, for my footsteps were quite audible on the hard snow. But she must have been taken up with her intentions, and I resolved not to disturb her. She knelt down by her father's grave, made the sign of the cross, and began to pray. At that moment, it struck midnight. At the last stroke, I saw Mademoiselle Daye life her eyes to the sky, and stretch out her arms as though in ecstasy. I was wondering what the reason could be when I myself raised my head, and everything within me seemed drawn toward the invisible, which was playing the most perfect music. Christine and I knew that music. We had heard it as children but it had never been executed with such divine art, even by Monsieur Daye. I remembered all that Christine had told me of the angel of music. The air was the resurrection of Lazarus, which old Monsieur Daye used to play to us in his hours of melancholy and of faith. If Christine's angel had existed, he could not have played better that night on the late musician's violin. When the music stopped, I, I seemed to hear a noise from the skulls in the heap of bones, it was as though they were chuckling, and I could not help shuddering. Question. Did it not occur to you that the musician might be hiding behind that very heap of bones? Réponse. It was the one thought that did occur to me, monsieur, so much so that I admitted to follow Mademoiselle Daye when she stood up and walked slowly to the gate. She was so much absorbed just then that I am not surprised that she did not see me. Question. Then what happened that you were found in the morning lying half dead on the steps of the high altar? Réponse. 
First a skull rolled to my feet, then another, then another. It was as if I were the mark of that ghastly game of bowls, and I had an idea that false step must have destroyed the balance of the structure behind which our musician was concealed. This surmise seemed to be confirmed when I saw a shadow suddenly glide along the sacristy wall. I ran up. The shadow had already pushed open the door and entered the church, but I was quicker than the shadow and caught hold of a corner of its cloak. At that moment, we were just in front of the high altar, and the moonbeams fell straight upon us through the stained-glass windows of the apse. As I did not let go of the cloak, the shadow turned round, and I saw a terrible death's head which darted a look at me from a pair of scorching eyes. I felt as if I were face to face with Satan, and, in the presence of this unearthly apparition, my heart gave way, my courage failed me, and I remembered nothing more until I recovered consciousness at the setting sun. End of chapter 5 The Enchanted Violin The Phantom of the Opera by Gaston Leroux Chapter 6 A Visit to Box 5 We left Monsieur Fermont Richard and Monsieur Armand Moncharmin at the moment when they were deciding to look into that little matter of Box 5 leaving behind them the broad staircase which leads from the lobby outside the manager's office to the stage and its dependencies, they crossed the stage, went out by the subscriber's door, and entered the house through the first little passage on the left. Then they made their way through the front rows of stalls and looked at box five on the grand tier. They could not see it well, because it was half in darkness, and because great covers were flung over the red velvet of the ledges of all the boxes. They were almost alone in the huge gloomy house, and a great silence surrounded them. It was the time when most of the stagehands go out for a drink. The staff had left the boards for the moment, leaving a scene half set. A few rays of light a wan, sinister light that seemed to have been stolen from an expiring luminary, fell through some opening or other upon an old tower that raised its pasteboard battlements on the stage. Everything in this deceptive light adopted a fantastic shape. In the orchestra stalls, the dregget covering them looked like an angry sea, whose glaucous waves had suddenly rendered stationary by a secret order from the storm phantom, who, as everybody knows, is called Adamaster. Messieurs Moncharmin and Richard were the shipwrecked mariners amid this motionless turmoil of a calico sea. They made for the left boxes, ploughing their way like sailors who leave their ship and try to struggle to the shore. The eight great polished columns stood up in the dusk like so many huge piles supporting the threatening, crumbling, big-bellied cliffs whose layers were represented by the circular, parallel, waving lines of the balconies of the grand, first, and second tiers of boxes. At the top, right on top of the cliff, lost in Monsieur Lenapvieux's copper ceiling, figures grinned and grimaced, laughed and jeered at Messieurs Richard and Moncharmin's distress. And yet these figures were usually very serious. Their names were Isis, Amphitrite, Hebe, Pandora, Psyche, Thetis, Pomona, Daphne, Clyte, Galatia, and Arethusa. Yes, Arethusa herself and Pandora, whom we all know by her box, looked down upon the two new managers of the opera, who ended by clutching at some piece of wreckage, and from there stared silently at box five on the grand tier. I have said that they were distressed. At least I presume so. Monsieur Moncharmin, in any case, admits that he was impressed. To quote his own words in his memoirs, this moonshine about the opera ghost in which, since we first took over the duties of Messieurs Poligny and Debien, we had been so nicely steeped. Moncharmin's style is not always irreproachable. 
had no doubt ended by blinding my imaginative and also my visual faculties. It may be that the exceptional surroundings in which we found ourselves in the midst of an incredible silence impressed us to an unusual extent. It may be that we were the sport of a kind of hallucination brought about by the semi-darkness of the theatre and the partial gloom that filled box five. At any rate, I saw, and Richard also saw, a shape in the box. Richard said nothing, nor I either. But we spontaneously seized each other's hand. We stood like that for some minutes without moving, with our eyes fixed on the same point. But the figure had disappeared. Then we went out, and, in the lobby, communicated our impressions to each other and talked about the shape. The misfortune was that my shape was not in the least like Richard's. I had seen a thing like a death's head resting on the ledge of the box, whereas Richard saw the shape of an old woman who looked like Madame Giry. We soon discovered that we had really been the victims of an illusion, whereupon, without further delay, and laughing like madmen, we ran to box five on the grand tier, went inside, and found no shape of any kind. Box five is just like all the other grand tier boxes. There is nothing to distinguish it from any of the others. Monsieur Moncharmin and Monsieur Richard, ostensibly highly amused and laughing at each other, moved the furniture of the box, lifted the cloths and the chairs, and particularly examined the armchair in which the man's voice used to sit. But they saw that it was a respectable armchair, with no magic about it. Altogether, the box was the most ordinary box in the world, with its red hangings, its chairs, its carpet, and its ledge covered in red velvet. After feeling the carpet in the most serious manner possible, and discovering nothing more here or anywhere else, they went down to the corresponding box on the pit tier below. In box five on the pit tier, which is just inside the first exit from the stalls on the left, They found nothing worth mentioning either. Those people are making fools of us, Fermin Richard ended by exclaiming. It will be Faust on Saturday. Let us both see the performance from Box Five on the Grand Tier. End of Chapter Six A Visit to Box Five. The Phantom of the Opera by Gaston Leroux. Chapter Seven, Faust and What Followed. On the Saturday morning, on reaching their office, the joint managers found a letter from O. G. worded in these terms: "My dear managers, so it is to be war between us. If you still care for peace, here is my ultimatum. It consists of the four following conditions: one." You must give me back my private box, and I wish it to be at my free disposal from henceforward. Two, the part of Margarita shall be sung this evening by Christine Daae. Never mind about Carlotta; she will be ill. Three, I absolutely insist upon the good and loyal services of Madame Giry, my box keeper, whom you will reinstate in her functions forthwith. Four, let me know by a letter handed to Madame Giry, who will see that it reaches me, that you accept, as your predecessors did, the conditions in my memorandum book relating to my monthly allowance. I will inform you later how you are to pay it to me. If you refuse, you will give Faust tonight in a house with a curse upon it. Take my advice and be warned in time. O、oh, G. Look here! I'm getting sick of him, sick of him! Shouted Richard, bringing his fist down on his office table. Just then, Mercier, the acting manager, entered. La Chanel would like to see one of you gentlemen, he said. He says that his business is urgent, and he seems quite upset. Who's La Chanel? Asked Richard. He's your stud groom. What do you mean, my stud groom? Yes, sir, explained Mercier. There are several grooms at the opera, and Monsieur Le Chanel is the head of them. And what does this groom do? He has the chief management of the stable. 
What stable? Why, yours, sir, the stable of the opera. Is there a stable at the opera? Upon my word, I didn't know. Where is it? In the cellars on the rotunda side. It's a very important department. We have twelve horses. Twelve horses? In what for in heaven's name? Why, we want trained horses for the processions in the juive, the profeta, and so on. Horses used to the boards. It is the groom's business to teach them. Monsieur Le Chanel is very clever at it. He used to manage Franconi's stables. Very well, but what does he want? I don't know. I never saw him in such a state. He can come in. Monsieur Le Chanel came in, carrying a riding whip, with which he struck his right boot in an irritable manner. Good morning, Monsieur Le Chanel, said Richard, somewhat impressed. To what do we owe the honor of your visit? Mr. Manager, I have come to ask you to get rid of the whole stable. What? You want to get rid of our horses? I'm not talking of the horses, but of the stablemen. How many stablemen have you, Monsieur Le Chanel? Six stablemen. That's at least two too many. These are places, Mercier interposed, created and forced upon us by the Under Secretary for Fine Arts. They are filled by protégés of the government, and, if I may venture to— I don't care a hang for the government, roared Richard. We don't need more than four stablemen for twelve horses. Eleven, said the head riding master, correcting him. Twelve, repeated Richard. Eleven, repeated La Chanel. Oh, the acting manager told me you had twelve horses. I did have twelve, but I have only eleven since Caesar was stolen. And Monsieur La Chanel gave himself a great smack on the boot with his whip. Has Caesar been stolen? cried the acting manager. Caesar, the white horse and the profeta? There are not two Caesars, said the stud groom dryly. I was ten years at Franconi's, and I have seen plenty of horses in my time. Well, there are not two Caesars, and he's been stolen. How? I don't know. Nobody knows. That's why I have come to ask you to sack the whole stable. What do your stablemen say? All sorts of nonsense. Some of them accuse the supers. Others pretend that it's the acting manager's doorkeeper. My doorkeeper? I'll answer for him as I would for myself, protested Mercier. But after all, Monsieur La Chanel, cried Richard, you must have some idea. Yes, I have, Monsieur La Chanel declared. I have an idea, and I'll tell you what it is. There's no doubt about it in my mind. He walked up to the two managers and whispered, It's the ghost who did the trick. Richard gave a jump. What? You too? You too? How do you mean, I too? Isn't it natural after what I saw? What did you see? I saw as clearly as I now see you a black shadow riding a white horse. That was as like Caesar as two peas. And did you run after them? I did, and I shouted, but they were too fast for me and disappeared in the darkness of the underground gallery. Monsieur Richard rose. That will do, Monsieur La Chanel. You can go. We will lodge a complaint against the ghost. And sack my stable? Oh, of course. Good morning. Monsieur La Chanel bowed and withdrew. Richard foamed at the mouth. Settle that idiot's account at once, please. He is a friend of the government representatives, Mercier ventured to say. And he takes his vermouth at Tortoni's with La Grande, Scholl, and Pertusier, the lion hunter, added Moncharmin. We shall have the whole press against us. He'll tell the story of the ghost, and everybody will be laughing at our expense. We may as well be dead as ridiculous. All right, say no more about it. At that moment the door opened. It must have been deserted by its usual Cerebrus, for Madame Giry entered without ceremony, holding a letter in her hand, and said hurriedly, I beg your pardon, excuse me, gentlemen, but I had a letter this morning from the opera ghost. He told me to come to you, that you had something to. She did not complete the sentence. She saw Fermin Richard's face, and it was a terrible sight. He seemed ready to burst. He said nothing, he could not speak. But suddenly he acted. First, his left arm seized upon the quaint person of Madame Giry and made her describe so unexpected a semicircle that she uttered a despairing cry. 
Next, his right foot imprinted its sole on the black taffeta of a skirt, which certainly had never before undergone a similar outrage in a similar place. The thing happened so quickly that Madame g e r y when in the passage, was still quite bewildered and seemed not to understand. But suddenly she understood, and the opera rang with her indignant yells, her violent protests and threats. About the same time, Carlotta, who had a small house of her own in the Rue du Faubourg Saint Honor, e rang for her maid, who brought her letters to her bed. Among them was an anonymous missive, written in red ink, in a hesitating, clumsy hand, which ran If you appear to night, you must be prepared for a great misfortune at the moment when you open your mouth to sing. A misfortune worse than death. The letter took away Carlotta's appetite for breakfast. She pushed back her chocolate, sat up in bed, and thought hard. It was not the first letter of the kind which she had received, but she never had one couched in such threatening terms. She thought herself at the time the victim of a thousand jealous attempts, and went about saying that she had a secret enemy who had sworn to ruin her. She pretended that a wicked plot was being hatched against her, a cabal which would come to a head one of these days, but she added that she was not the woman to be intimidated. The truth is that, if there was a cabal, It was led by Carlotta herself against poor Christine, who had no suspicion of it. Carlotta had never forgiven Christine for the triumph which she had achieved when taking her place at a moment's notice. When Carlotta heard of the astounding reception bestowed upon her understudy, she was at once cured of an incipient attack of bronchitis and a bad fit of sulking against the management, and lost the slightest inclination to shirk her duties. From that time, she worked with all her might to smother her rival, enlisting the services of influential friends to persuade the managers not to give Christine an opportunity for a fresh triumph. Certain newspapers, which had begun to extol the talent of Christine, now interested themselves only in the fame of Carlotta. Lastly, in the theatre itself, the celebrated but heartless and soulless diva made the most scandalous remarks about Christine. And tried to cause her endless minor unpleasantnesses. When Carlotta had finished thinking over the threat contained in the strange letter, she got up. We shall see, she said, adding a few oaths in her native Spanish with a very determined air. The first thing she saw when looking out of her window was a hearse. She was very superstitious, and the hearse and the letter convinced her that she was running the most serious dangers that evening. She collected all her supporters. Told them that she was threatened at that evening's performance with a plot organized by Christine Daye, and declared that they must play a trick upon that chit by filling the house with her, Carlotta's admirers. She had no lack of them, had she? She relied upon them to hold themselves prepared for any eventuality, and to silence the adversaries if, as she feared, they created a disturbance. Monsieur Richard's private secretary called. To ask after the diva's health, and returned with the assurance that she was perfectly well, and that, were she dying, she would sing the part of Margarita that evening. The secretary urged her, in his chief's name, to commit no imprudence, to stay at home all day, and to be careful of drafts, and Carlotta could not help, after he had gone, comparing this unusual and unexpected advice with the threats contained in the letter. It was five o'clock when the post brought a second anonymous letter in the same hand as the first. It was short and said simply, You have a bad cold. If you are wise, you will see that it is madness to try to sing tonight. Carlotta sneered, shrugged her handsome shoulders, and sang two or three notes to reassure herself. Her friends were faithful to their promise. They were all at the opera that night. But looked round in vain for the fierce conspirators whom they were instructed to suppress. The only unusual thing was the presence of Monsieur Richard and Monsieur Moncharmin in box five. Carlotta's friends thought that perhaps the managers had wind on their side of the proposed disturbance and that they had determined to be in the house so as to stop it then and there. But this was unjustifiable supposition, as the reader knows. Monsieur Richard and Monsieur Moncharmin 
were thinking of nothing but their ghost. Vain, in vain do I call, through my vigil weary, on creation and its lord. Never reply will break the silence dreary, no sign, no single word. The famous baritone, Carolus Fonta, had hardly finished Dr. Faust's first appeal to the powers of darkness, when M. Fermin Richard, who was sitting in the ghost's own chair, the front chair on the right, leaned over to his partner and asked him chaffingly, "'Well, has the ghost whispered a word in your ear yet?' "'Wait, don't be in such a hurry,' replied M. Armand Moncharmin, in the same gay tone. "'The performance has only begun, and you know that the ghost does not usually come until the middle of the first act.' The first act passed without incident, which did not surprise Carlotta's friends, because Margarita does not sing in this act. As for the managers, they looked at each other when the curtain fell. "'That's one,' said Montcharmin. "'Yes, the ghost is late,' said Fermin Richard. "'It's not a bad house,' said Montcharmin, "'for a house with a curse on it.' Monsieur Richard smiled and pointed to a fat, rather vulgar woman, dressed in black, sitting in a stall in the middle of the auditorium, with a man in a broadcloth frock-coat on either side of her. "'Who on earth are those?' asked Montcharmin. "'Those, my dear fellow, are my concierge, her husband, and her brother. "'Did you give them tickets?' "'I did. My concierge has never been to the opera. "'This is the first time, and as she is now going to come every night, "'I wanted her to have a good seat before spending her time showing other people to theirs.' Montcharmin asked what he meant, and Richard answered that he had persuaded his concierge, in whom he had the greatest confidence, to come and take Madame Giry's place. Yes, he would like to see if, with that woman instead of the old lunatic, Box Five would continue to astonish the natives. By the way, said Montcharmin, you know that Mother Giry is going to lodge a complaint against you. With whom, the ghost? The ghost! Montcharmin had almost forgotten him. However, that mysterious person did nothing to bring himself to the memory of the managers, and they were just saying so to each other for the second time, when the door of the box suddenly opened to admit the startled stage manager. "'What's the matter?' they both asked, amazed at seeing him there at such a time. "'It seems there's a plot got up by Christine Daae's friends against Carlotta. Carlotta's furious.' "'What on earth?' said Richard, knitting his brows. But the curtain rose on the Kermess scene, and Richard made a sign to the stage manager to go away. When the two were alone again, Montcharmin leaned over to Richard. "'Then Daya has friends?' he asked. "'Yes, she has. Whom?' Richard glanced across at a box on the grand tier containing no one but two men. "'The Comte de Chagny?' "'Yes, he spoke to me in her favour with such warmth that, "'if I had not known him to be Sorelli's friend—' "'Really?' said Montcharmin. "'And who is that pale young man beside him?' "'That's his brother, the Viscount. "'He ought to be in bed. He looks ill.' "'The stage rang with gay song. "'Red or white liquor, coarse or fine, "'what can it matter, so we have wine?' Students, citizens, soldiers, girls, and matrons whirled light-heartedly before the inn, with the figure of Bacchus for a sign. Cybele made her entrance, Christine Daae looked charming in her boy's clothes, and Carlotta's partisans expected to hear her greeted with an ovation which would have enlightened them as to the intentions of her friends. But nothing happened. On the other hand, when Margarita crossed the stage— and sang the only two lines allotted her in this second act. No, my lord, not a lady am I, nor yet a beauty, and do not need an arm to help me on my way. Carlotta was received with enthusiastic applause. It was so unexpected, and so uncalled for, that those who knew nothing about the rumors looked at one another, and asked what was happening. And this act also was finished without incident. Then everybody said— of course it will be during the next act. Some, who seemed to be better informed than the rest, declared that the row would begin with the ballad of the King of Thule, and rushed to the subscriber's entrance to warn Carlotta. The managers left the box during the entr'acte to find out more about the cabal of which the stage manager had spoken, but they soon returned to their seats, 
shrugging their shoulders, and treating the whole affair as silly. The first thing they saw on entering the box was a box of English sweets on the little shelf of the ledge. Who had put it there? They asked the box keepers, but none of them knew. Then they went back to the shelf and, next to the box of sweets, found an opera glass. They looked at each other. They had no inclination to laugh. All that Madame Giry had told them returned to their memory, and then, and then, they seemed to feel a curious sort of draft around them. They sat down in silence. The scene represented Margarita's garden. Gentle flowers in the dew, be message from me. As she sang these first two lines, with her bunch of roses and lilacs in her hand, Christine, raising her head, saw the Vicomte de Chagny in the box, and from that moment her voice seemed less sure, less crystal clear than usual. Something seemed to deaden and dull her singing. What a queer girl she is, said one of Carlotta's friends in the stalls almost aloud. The other day she was divine, and tonight she's simply bleating. She has no experience, no training. Gentle flowers, lie ye there, and tell her from me. The Viscount put his head under his hands and wept. The Count, behind him, viciously gnawed his mustache, shrugged his shoulders, and frowned. For him, usually so cold and correct, to betray his inner feelings like that by outward signs, the Count must be very angry. He was. He had seen his brother return from a rapid and mysterious journey in an alarming state of health. The explanation that followed was unsatisfactory, and the Count asked Christine Daye for an appointment. She had the audacity to reply that she could not see either him or his brother. Would she but deign to hear me, and with one smile to cheer me? The little baggage, growled the Count, and he wondered what she wanted. What she was hoping for. She was a virtuous girl. She was said to have no friend, no protector of any sort. That angel from the north must be very artful. Raoul, behind the curtain of his hands that veiled his boyish tears, thought only of the letter which he received on his return to Paris, where Christine, fleeing from Perrault like a thief in the night, had arrived before him. My dear little playfellow, You must have the courage not to see me again, not to speak of me again. If you love me just a little, do this for me, for me who will never forget you, my dear Raoul. My life depends upon it, your life depends upon it, your little Christine. Thunders of applause. Carlotta made her entrance. I wish I could but know who was he that addressed me, if he was noble or at least what his name is. When Margarita had finished singing the ballad of the King of Thule, she was loudly cheered, and again when she came to the end of the jewel song, Ah, the joy of past compare, these jewels bright to wear. Thenceforth, certain of herself, certain of her friends in the house, certain of her voice and her success, fearing nothing, Carlotta flung herself into her part without restraint of modesty. She was no longer Margarita, she was Carmen. She was applauded all the more, and her debut with Faust seemed about to bring her a new success, when suddenly a terrible thing happened. Faust had knelt on one knee. Let me gaze on the form below me, while from yonder ether blue, look how the star of Eve, bright and tender, lingers o'er me, to love thy beauty too. And Margarita replied, Oh, how strange, like a spell, does the evening bind me. And a deep languid charm I feel without alarm, with its melody enwind me, and all my heart subdue. At that moment, at that identical moment, the terrible thing happened. Carlotta croaked like a toad. Quack! There was consternation on Carlotta's face, and consternation on the faces of all the audience. The two managers in their box could not suppress an exclamation of horror. Everyone felt that the thing was not natural. That there was witchcraft behind it. That toad smelt of brimstone. Poor, wretched, despairing, crushed Carlotta. The uproar in the house was indescribable. If the thing had happened to anyone but Carlotta, she would have been hooted. But everybody knew how perfect an instrument her voice was, and there was no display of anger, 
but only of horror and dismay, the sort of dismay which men would have felt if they had witnessed the catastrophe that broke the arms of the Venus de Milo. And even then they would have seen and understood. But here that toad was incomprehensible, so much so that, after some seconds spent in asking herself if she had really heard that note, that sound, that infernal noise issue from her throat, she tried to persuade herself that it was not so, that she was the victim of an illusion, an illusion of the ear, and not an act of treachery on the part of her voice. Meanwhile, in box five, Montcharmin and Richard had turned very pale. This extraordinary and inexplicable incident filled them with a dread which was the more mysterious inasmuch as for some little while they had fallen without the direct influence of the ghost. They had felt his breath. Montcharmin's hair stood on end. Richard wiped the perspiration from his forehead. Yes, the ghost was there, around them, behind them, beside them. They felt his presence without seeing him. They heard his breath close, close, close to them. They were sure that there were three people in the box. They trembled. They thought of running away. They dared not. They dared not make a movement or exchange a word that would have told the ghost that they knew that he was there. What was going to happen? This happened. Quack! Their joint explanation of horror was heard all over the house. They felt that they were smarting under the ghost's attacks. Leaning over the edge of their box, they stared at Carlotta as though they did not recognize her. That infernal girl must have given the signal for some catastrophe. Ah, they were waiting for the catastrophe. The ghost had told them it would come. The house had a curse upon it. The two managers gasped and panted under the weight of the catastrophe. Richard's stifled voice was heard calling to Carlotta. Well, go on. No, Carlotta did not go on. Bravely, heroically, she started afresh on the fatal line at the end of which the toad had appeared. An awful silence succeeded the uproar. Carlotta's voice alone once more filled the resounding house. I feel without alarm. The audience also felt, but not without alarm. I feel without alarm. I feel without alarm. Quack! With its melody and wind me. Quack! And all my heart sub quack! The toad had also started afresh. The house broke into a wild tumult. The two managers collapsed in their chairs and dared not even turn round. They had not the strength. The ghost was chuckling behind their backs. And at last they distinctly heard his voice in their right ears, the impossible voice, the mouthless voice, saying, She is singing tonight to bring the chandelier down. With one accord they raised their eyes to the ceiling and uttered a terrible cry. The chandelier, the immense mass of the chandelier, was slipping down, coming toward them, at the call of that fiendish voice. Released from its hook, It plunged from the ceiling and came smashing into the middle of the stalls amid a thousand shouts of terror. A wild rush for the doors followed. The papers of the day state that there were numbers wounded and one killed. The chandelier had crashed down upon the head of the wretched woman who had come to the opera for the first time in her life, the one whom Monsieur Richard had appointed to succeed Madame Giry, the ghost box keeper, in her functions. She died on the spot, and the next morning a newspaper appeared with this heading Two hundred kilos on the head of a concierge. That was her sole epitaph. End of chapter seven Faust and what followed. The Phantom of the Opera by Gaston Leroux. Chapter eight The Mysterious Brahm. That tragic evening was bad for everybody. Carlotta fell ill. As for Christine Daae, she disappeared after the performance. A fortnight elapsed during which she was seen neither at the opera nor outside. Raoul, of course, was the first to be astonished at the prima donna's absence. He wrote to her at Madame Valerius's flat and received no reply. His grief increased 
and he ended by being seriously alarmed at never seeing her name on the program. Faust was played without her. One afternoon he went to the manager's office to ask the reason of Christine's disappearance. He found them both looking extremely worried. Their own friends did not recognize them. They had lost all their gaiety and spirits. They were seen crossing the stage with hanging heads, care-worn brows, pale cheeks, as though pursued by some abominable thought or a prey to some persistent sport of fate. The fall of the chandelier had involved them in no little responsibility, but it was difficult to make them speak about it. The inquest had ended in a verdict of accidental death, caused by the wear and tear of the chains by which the chandelier was hung from the ceiling. But it was the duty of both the old and the new managers to have discovered this wear and tear, and to have remedied it in time. And I feel bound to say that Messieurs Richard and Montchamin, at this time, appeared so changed, so absent-minded, so mysterious, so incomprehensible, that many of the subscribers thought that some event even more horrible than the fall of the chandelier must have affected their state of mind. In their daily intercourse they showed themselves very impatient, except with Madame Jury, who had been reinstated in her functions, and their reception of the Vicomte de Chagny, when he came to ask about Christine, was anything but cordial. They merely told him that she was taking a holiday. He asked how long the holiday was for, and they replied curtly that it was for an unlimited period, as Mademoiselle Daye had requested leave of absence for reasons of health. "'Then she is ill!' he cried. "'What is the matter with her?' "'We don't know. Didn't you send the doctor of the opera to see her?' "'No, she did not ask for him. And, as we trust her, we took her word. Raoul left the building, a prey to the gloomiest thoughts. He resolved, come what might, to go and inquire of Mama Valerius. He remembered the strong phrases in Christine's letter, forbidding him to make any attempt to see her. But what he had seen at Perrault, what he had heard behind the dressing-room door, his conversation with Christine at the edge of the moor, made him suspect some machination, which, devilish though it might be, was none the less human. The girl's highly strong imagination, her affectionate and credulous mind, the primitive education which had surrounded her childhood with a circle of legends, the constant brooding over her dead father, and, above all, the state of sublime ecstasy into which music threw her from the moment that this art was made manifest to her in certain exceptional conditions, as in the churchyard at Perrault. All this seemed to him to constitute a moral ground only too favorable for the malevolent designs of some mysterious and unscrupulous person. Of whom was Christine Daae the victim? This was the very reasonable question which Raoul put to himself as he hurried off to Mama Valerius. He trembled as he rang at a little flat in the Rue Notre-Dame de Victoire. The door was opened by the maid whom he had seen coming out of Christine's dressing-room one evening. He asked if he could speak to Madame Valerius. He was told that she was ill in bed and was not receiving visitors. "'Take in my card, please,' he said. The maid soon returned, and showed him into a small and scantily furnished drawing-room, in which portraits of Professor Valerius and old Daae hung on opposite walls. "'Madame begs Monsieur le Vicomte to excuse her,' said the servant. "'She can only see him in her bedroom, because she can no longer stand on her poor legs.' Five minutes later, Raoul was ushered into an ill-lit room, where he at once recognized the good, kind face of Christine's benefactress in the semi-darkness of an alcove. Mama Valerius's hair was now quite white, 
but her eyes had grown no older. Never, on the contrary, had their expression been so bright, so pure, so childlike. Monsieur de Chagny! she cried gaily, putting out both her hands to her visitor. Ah, it's heaven that sends you here. We can talk of her. This last sentence sounded very gloomily in the young man's ears. He at once asked, Madame, where is Christine? And the old lady replied calmly, She is with her good genius. What good genius? exclaimed poor Raoul. Why, the angel of music! The viscount dropped into a chair. Really? Christine was with the angel of music? And there lay Mamma Valerius in bed, smiling to him and putting her finger to her lips to warn him to be silent. And she added, You must not tell anybody. You can rely on me, said Raoul. He hardly knew what he was saying, for his ideas about Christine, already greatly confused, were becoming more and more entangled, and it seemed as if everything was beginning to turn around him, around the room, around that extraordinary good lady with the white hair and forget me not eyes. I know, I know I can, she said with a happy laugh. But why don't you come near me, as you used to do when you were a little boy? Give me your hands, as when you brought me the story of little Lottie, which Daddy Daye had told you. I am very fond of you, Monsieur Raoul, you know, and so is Christine, too. She is fond of me, sighed the young man. He found a difficulty in collecting his thoughts and bringing them to bear on Mama Valerius's good genius on the angel of music of whom Christine had spoken to him so strangely, on the death's head which he had seen in a sort of nightmare on the high altar at Perot, and also on the opera ghost, whose fame had come to his ears one evening when he was standing behind the scenes within hearing of a group of scene-shifters who were repeating the ghastly description which the hanged man, Joseph Bouquet, had given of the ghost before his mysterious death. He asked in a low voice, What makes you think that Christine is fond of me, madam? She used to speak of you every day. Really? And what did she tell you? She told me that you had made her a proposal. And the good old lady began laughing wholeheartedly. Raoul sprang from his chair, flushing to the temples, suffering agonies. What's this? Where are you going? Sit down again at once, will you? Do you think I will let you go like that? If you're angry with me for laughing, I beg your pardon. After all, what has happened isn't your fault. Didn't you know? Did you think that Christine was free? Is Christine engaged to be married? The wretched Raoul asked, in a choking voice. Why no, why no? You know as well as I do that Christine couldn't marry, even if she wanted to. But I don't know anything about it. And why can't Christine marry? Because of the angel of music, of course. I don't follow. Yes, he forbids her to. He forbids her. The angel of music forbids her to marry. Oh, he forbids her, without forbidding her. It's like this. He tells her that, if she got married, she would never hear him again. That's all and that he would go away forever. So, you understand, she can't let the angel of music go. It's quite natural. Yes, yes, echoed Raoul submissively. It's quite natural. Besides, I thought Christine had told you all that when she met you at Perot, where she went with her good genius. Oh, she went to Perot with her good genius, did she? That is to say, he arranged to meet her down there, in Perrault churchyard, at Daae's grave. He promised to play her the resurrection of Lazarus on her father's violin. Raoul de Chagny rose, and with a very authoritative air, pronounced these peremptory words. Madam, you will have the goodness to tell me where that genius lives. The old lady did not seem surprised at this indiscreet command. She raised her eyes and said, In heaven. Such simplicity baffled him. 
He did not know what to say in the presence of this candid and perfect faith, in a genius who came down nightly from heaven to haunt the dressing-rooms at the opera. He now realized the possible state of mind of a girl brought up between a superstitious fiddler and a visionary old lady, and he shuddered when he thought of the consequences of it all. "'Is Christine still a good girl?' he asked suddenly, in spite of himself. "'I swear it, as I hope to be saved,' exclaimed the old woman, who, this time, seemed to be incensed. "'And if you doubt it, sir, I don't know what you are here for.' Raoul tore at his gloves. "'How long has she known this genius?' "'About three months. "'Yes, it's quite three months since he began to give her lessons.' The Viscount threw up his arms with a gesture of despair. "'The genius gives her lessons? And where, pray? "'Now that she has gone away with him, I can't say. "'But up to a fortnight ago it was in Christine's dressing-room. "'It would be impossible in this little flat. "'The whole house would hear them. "'Where is it the opera, at eight o'clock in the morning?' There was no one about. Do you see? Yes, I see, I see, cried the Viscount. And he hurriedly took leave of Madame Valerius, who asked herself if the young nobleman was not a little off his head. He walked home to his brother's house in a pitiful state. He could have struck himself, banged his head against the walls, to think that he had believed in her innocence, in her purity. The angel of music! He knew him now. He saw him. It was beyond a doubt some unspeakable tenor, a good-looking jackanapes, who mouthed and simpered as he sang. He thought himself as absurd and as wretched as could be. Oh, what a miserable, little, insignificant, silly young man was Monsieur le Vicomte de Chagny, thought Raoul furiously, and she— what a bold and damnable sly creature! His brother was waiting for him, and Raoul fell into his arms like a child. The Count consoled him without asking for explanations, and Raoul would certainly have long hesitated before telling him the story of the Angel of Music. His brother suggested taking him out to dinner. Overcome as he was with despair, Raoul would probably have refused any invitation that evening if the Count had not, as an inducement, told him that the lady of his thoughts had been seen, the night before, in company of the other sex, in the Bois. At first the Viscount refused to believe, but he received such exact details that he ceased protesting. She had been seen, it appeared, driving in a brougham with the window down, she seemed to be slowly taking in the icy night air. There was a glorious moon shining. She was recognized beyond a doubt. As for her companion, only his shadowy outline was distinguished, leaning back in the dark. The carriage was going at a walking pace, in a lonely drive, behind the grandstand at Longchamp. Raoul dressed in a frantic haste, prepared to forget his distress by flinging himself as people say, into the vortex of pleasure. Alas, he was a very sorry guest, and leaving his brother early, found himself, by ten o'clock in the evening, in a cab behind the Longchamp race-course. It was bitterly cold. The road seemed deserted and very bright under the moonlight. He told the driver to wait for him patiently at the corner of a near turning, and hiding himself as well as he could, stood stamping his feet to keep warm. He had been indulging in this healthy exercise for half an hour or so, when a carriage turned the corner of the road and came quietly in his direction at a walking pace. As it approached, he saw that a woman was leaning her head from the window, and suddenly the moon shed a pale gleam over her features. "'Christine!' The sacred name of his love had sprung from his heart and his lips. He could not keep it back. He would have given anything to withdraw it, for that name, proclaimed in the stillness of the night, had acted as though it were the preconcerted signal for a furious rush on the part of the whole turnout, 
which he dashed past him before he could put into execution his plan of leaping at the horse's heads. The carriage window had been closed, and the girl's face had disappeared, and the brougham behind which he was now running was no more than a black spot on the white road. He called out again, Christine! No reply, and he stopped in the midst of the silence. With a lackluster eye, he stared down that cold, desolate road and into the pale, dead night. Nothing was colder than his heart, nothing half so dead. He had loved an angel, and now he despised a woman. Raoul, how that little fairy of the north has trifled with you! Was it really, was it really necessary to have so fresh and young a face, a forehead so shy and always ready to cover itself with the pink blush of modesty in order to pass in the lonely night in a carriage and pair accompanied by a mysterious lover? Surely there should be some limit to hypocrisy and lying. She had passed without answering his cry, and he was thinking of dying and he was twenty years old. His valet found him in the morning sitting on his bed. He had not undressed, and the servant feared at the sight of his face that some disaster had occurred. Raoul snatched his letters from the man's hands. He had recognized Christine's paper and handwriting. She said, Dear, go to the masked ball at the opera on the night after tomorrow. At twelve o'clock, be in the little room behind the chimney place of the big crush room. Stand near the door that leads to the rotunda. Don't mention this appointment to anyone on earth. Wear a white domino and be carefully masked. As you love me, do not let yourself be recognized. Christine. End of chapter 8. THE PHANTOM OF THE OPERA by Gaston Leroux CHAPTER Nine, AT THE MASKED BALL The envelope was covered with mud and unstamped. It bore the words, To be handed to Monsieur le Vicomte Raoul de Chagny, with the address in pencil. It must have been flung out in the hope that a passer-by would pick up the note and deliver it, which was what happened. The note had been picked up on the pavement of the Place de l'Opera. Raoul read it over again with fevered eyes. No more was needed to revive his hope. The sombre picture, which he had for a moment imagined of a Christine forgetting her duty to herself, made way for his original conception of an unfortunate, innocent child, the victim of imprudence and exaggerated sensibility. To what extent, at this time, was she really a victim? Whose prisoner was she? Into what whirlpool had she been dragged? He asked himself these questions with a cruel anguish, but even this pain seemed endurable beside the frenzy into which he was thrown at the thought of a lying and deceitful Christine. What had happened? What influence had she undergone? What monster had carried her off, and by what means? By what means, indeed, but that of music? He knew of Christine's story. After her father's death, she acquired a distaste of everything in life, including her art. She went through the conservatoire like a poor, soulless singing machine, and suddenly she awoke as though through the intervention of a god. The angel of music appeared upon the scene. She sang Margarita in Faust and triumphed. The angel of music. For three months the angel of music had been giving Christine lessons. Ah, he was a punctual singing master, and now he was taking her for drives in the bois. Raoul's fingers clutched at his flesh above his jealous heart. In his inexperience he now asked himself with terror what game the girl was playing. Up to what point could an opera singer make a fool of a good-natured young man, quite new to love? Oh, misery! Thus did Raoul's thoughts fly from one extreme to the other. 
He no longer knew whether to pity Christine or to curse her, and he pitied and cursed her turn and turn about. At all events, he bought a white domino. The hour of the appointment came at last. With his face in a mask trimmed with long, thick lace, looking like a pirot in his white wrap, the Viscount thought himself very ridiculous. Men of the world do not go to the opera ball in fancy dress. It was absurd. One thought, however, consoled the Viscount. He would certainly never be recognized. This ball was an exceptional affair, given some time before Shrovetide, in honor of the anniversary of the birth of a famous draftsman, and it was expected to be much gayer, noisier, more bohemian than the ordinary masked ball. Numbers of artists had arranged to go, accompanied by a whole cohort of models and pupils, who, by midnight, began to create a tremendous din. Raoul climbed the grand staircase at five minutes to twelve, did not linger to look at the motley dresses displayed all the way up the marble steps. One of the richest settings in the world allowed no facetious mask to draw him into a war of wits, replied to no jests, and shook off the bold familiarity of a number of couples who had already become a trifle too gay. Crossing the big crush room and escaping from a mad whirl of dancers in which he was caught for a moment, he at last entered the room mentioned in Christine's letter. He found it crammed, for this small space was the point where all those who were going to take supper in the rotunda crossed those who were returning from taking a glass of champagne. The fun here waxed fast and furious. Raoul leaned against a doorpost and waited. He did not wait long. A black domino passed and gave a quick squeeze to the tips of his fingers. He understood that it was she, and followed her. "'Is that you, Christine?' he asked, between his teeth. The black domino turned round promptly, and raised her finger to her lips, no doubt to warn him not to mention her name again. Raoul continued to follow her in silence. He was afraid of losing her, after meeting her again in such strange circumstances. His grudge against her was gone— he no longer doubted that she had nothing to reproach herself with, however peculiar and inexplicable her conduct might seem. He was ready to make any display of clemency, forgiveness, or cowardice. He was in love, and no doubt he would soon receive a very natural explanation of her curious absence. The black domino turned back from time to time to see if the white domino was still following. As Raoul once more passed through the great crush-room, this time in the wake of his guide, he could not help noticing a group crowding round a person whose disguise, eccentric air, and gruesome appearance were causing a sensation. It was a man dressed all in scarlet, with a huge hat and feathers on the top of a wonderful death's head. From his shoulders hung an immense red velvet cloak, which trailed along the floor like a king's train and on this cloak was embroidered, in gold letters, which everyone read and repeated aloud, Don't touch me! I am Red Death, stalking abroad. Then one, greatly daring, did try to touch him, but a skeleton hand shot out of a crimson sleeve, and violently seized the rash one's wrist, and he, feeling the clutch of the knuckle-bones, the furious grasp of death, uttered a cry of pain and terror. When Red Death released him at last, he ran away like a very madman, pursued by the jeers of the bystanders. It was at this moment that Raoul passed in front of the funereal masquerader, who had just happened to turn in his direction, and he nearly exclaimed, The death's head of Perot Garic! He had recognized him. He wanted to dart forward, forgetting Christine, but the black domino, who also seemed a prey to some strange excitement, caught him by the arm, and dragged him from the crush-room, far from the mad crowd through which Red Death was stalking. The black domino kept on turning back, and apparently, on two occasions, saw something that startled her, for she hurried her pace, and Raoul's, as though they were being pursued. They went up two floors. Here the stairs and corridors were almost deserted. 
The black domino opened the door of a private box and beckoned to the white domino to follow her. Then Christine, whom he recognized by the sound of her voice, closed the door behind them and warned him in a whisper to remain at the back of the box and on no account to show himself. Raoul took off his mask. Christine kept hers on. And when Raoul was about to ask her to remove it, he was surprised to see her put her ear to the partition and listen eagerly for a sound outside. Then she opened the door ajar, looked out into the corridor, and, in a low voice, said, He must have gone up higher. Suddenly she exclaimed, He is coming down again. She tried to close the door, but Raoul prevented her, for he had seen, on the top step of the staircase that led to the floor above, a red foot, followed by another, and slowly, majestically, the whole scarlet dress of red death met his eyes, and he once more saw the death's head of Perrault Gorique. It's he! he exclaimed. This time he shall not escape me! But Christine had slammed the door at the moment when Raoul was on the point of rushing out. He tried to push her aside. Whom do you mean by he? she asked in a changed voice. Who shall not escape you? Raoul tried to overcome the girl's resistance by force, but she repelled him with a strength which he would not have suspected in her. He understood, or thought he understood, and at once lost his temper. Who? he repeated angrily. Why, he, the man who hides behind that hideous mask of death, the evil genius of the churchyard at Perrault, Red Death, in a word, madam, your friend, your angel of music, but I shall snatch off his mask, as I shall snatch off my own, and this time we shall look each other in the face, he and I, with no veil and no lies between us, and I shall know whom you love, and who loves you. He burst into a mad laugh, while Christine gave a disconsolate moan behind her velvet mask. With a tragic gesture she flung out her two arms, which fixed a barrier of white flesh against the door. In the name of our love, Raoul, you shall not pass. He stopped. What had she said? In the name of their love? Never before had she confessed that she loved him. And yet she had had opportunities enough. Pooh, her only objection was to gain a few seconds. She wished to give the Red Death time to escape, and in accents of childish hatred, he said, You lie, madam, for you do not love me, and you have never loved me. What a poor fellow I must be to let you mock and flout me as you have done. Why did you give me every reason for hope at Perrault, for honest hope, madame? For I am an honest man, and I believed you to be an honest woman, when your only intention was to deceive me. Alas, you have deceived us all. You have taken a shameful advantage of the candid affection of your benefactress herself, who continues to believe in your sincerity, while you go about the opera ball with red death. I despise you. And he burst into tears. She allowed him to insult her. She thought of but one thing— to keep him from leaving the box. You will beg my pardon one day for all those ugly words, Raoul, and when you do, I shall forgive you. He shook his head. No, no, you have driven me mad. When I think that I had only one object in life, to give my name to an opera wench. Raoul, how can you? I shall die of shame. No, dear, live, said Christine's grave and changed voice. And good-bye. Good-bye, Raoul. The boy stepped forward, staggering as he went. He risked one more sarcasm. Oh, you must let me come and applaud you from time to time. I shall never sing again, Raoul. Really? he replied, still more satirically. So he is taking you off the stage. I congratulate you. But we shall meet in the Bois one of these evenings. Not in the Bois, nor anywhere, Raoul. You shall not see me again. May one ask at least to what darkness you are returning? For what hell are you leaving, mysterious lady? Or for what paradise? I came to tell you, dear, but I can't tell you now. You would not believe me. You have lost faith in me, Raoul. It is finished. She spoke in such a despairing voice that the lad began to feel remorse for his cruelty. But look here, he cried. 
Can't you tell me what all this means? You are free. There is no one to interfere with you. You go about Paris. You put on a domino to come to the ball. Why do you not go home? What have you been doing this past fortnight? What is this tale about the angel of music which you have been telling Mama Valerius? Some one may have taken you in, played upon your innocence. I was a witness of it myself at Perot, but you know what to believe now. You seem to me quite sensible, Christine. You know what you are doing, and meanwhile Mama Valerius lies waiting for you at home and appealing to your good genius. Explain yourself, Christine, I beg of you. Any one might have been deceived as I was. What is this farce? Christine simply took off her mask and said, Dear, it is a tragedy. Raoul now saw her face and could not restrain an exclamation of surprise and terror. The fresh complexion of former days was gone. A mortal pallor covered those features which he had known so charming and so gentle, and sorrow had furrowed them with pitiless lines and traced dark and unspeakably sad shadows under her eyes. My dearest, my dearest, he moaned, holding out his arms, you promised to forgive me. Perhaps, some day perhaps, she said, resuming her mask, and she went away, forbidding him with a gesture to follow her. He tried to disobey her, but she turned round and repeated her gesture of farewell with such authority that he dared not move a step. He watched her till she was out of sight. Then he also went down among the crowd, hardly knowing what he was doing, with throbbing temples and an aching heart. And as he crossed the dancing floor, he asked if anybody had seen Red Death. Yes, everyone had seen Red Death, but Raoul could not find him. And, at two o'clock in the morning, he turned down the passage, behind the scenes that led to Christine Daae's dressing room. His footsteps took him to that room where he had first known suffering. He tapped at the door. There was no answer. He entered, as he had entered when he looked everywhere for the man's voice. The room was empty. A gas jet was burning, turned down low. He saw some writing paper on a little desk. He thought of writing to Christine, but he heard steps in the passage. He had only time to hide in the inner room, which was separated from the dressing room by a curtain. Christine entered, took off her mask with a weary movement, and flung it on the table. She sighed and let her pretty head fall into her two hands. What was she thinking of? Of Raoul? No, for Raoul heard her murmur, Poor Eric! At first he thought he must be mistaken. To begin with, he was persuaded that, if anyone was to be pitied, it was he, Raoul. It would have been quite natural if she had said, Poor Raoul, after what had happened between them. But, shaking her head, she repeated, Poor Eric! What had this Eric to do with Christine's sighs, and why was she pitying Eric when Raoul was so unhappy? Christine began to write, deliberately, calmly, and so placidly, that Raoul, who was still trembling from the effects of the tragedy that separated them, was painfully impressed. What coolness! he said to himself. She wrote on, filling two, three, four sheets. Suddenly she raised her head and hid the sheets in her bodice. She seemed to be listening. Raoul also listened. Whence came that strange sound, that distant rhythm? A faint singing seemed to issue from the walls. Yes, it was as though the walls themselves were singing. The song became plainer. The words were now distinguishable. He heard a voice, a very beautiful, very soft, very captivating voice. But for all its softness, it remained a male voice. The voice came nearer and nearer. It came through the wall. It approached and now the voice was in the room, in front of Christine. Christine rose and addressed the voice, as though speaking to someone. Here I am, Eric, she said. I am ready, but you are late. Raoul, peeping from behind the curtain, could not believe his eyes, which showed him nothing. Christine's face lit up. 
A smile of happiness appeared upon her bloodless lips, a smile like that of sick people when they receive the first hope of recovery. The voice without a body went on singing, and certainly Raoul had never in his life heard anything more absolutely and heroically sweet, more gloriously insidious, more delicate, more powerful, in short, more irresistibly triumphant. He listened to it in a fever, and he now began to understand how Christine Daae was able to appear one evening before the stupefied audience with accents of a beauty hitherto unknown, of a superhuman exultation, while doubtless still under the influence of the mysterious and invisible master. The voice was singing the wedding night song from Romeo and Juliet. Raoul saw Christine stretch out her arms to the voice as she had done in Perrault churchyard, to the invisible violin playing the resurrection of Lazarus and nothing could describe the passion with which the voice sang, Fate links thee to me for ever and a day. The strains went through Raoul's heart. Struggling against the charm that seemed to deprive him of all his will and all his energy, and of almost all his lucidity at the moment when he needed them most, he succeeded in drawing back the curtain that hid him, and he walked to where Christine stood. She herself was moving to the back of the room, the whole wall of which was occupied by a great mirror that reflected her image, but not his, for he was just behind her, and entirely covered by her. Fate links thee to me forever and a day. Christine walked toward her image in the glass, and the image came toward her. The two Christines, the real one and the reflection, ended by touching and Raoul put out his arms to clasp the two in one embrace. But, by a sort of dazzling miracle that sent him staggering, Raoul was suddenly flung back, while an icy blast swept over his face. He saw not two, but four, eight, twenty Christines spinning round him, laughing at him and fleeing so swiftly that he could not touch one of them. At last everything stood still again, and he saw himself in the glass. But Christine had disappeared. He rushed up to the glass. He struck at the walls. Nobody. And meanwhile, the room still echoed with the distant, passionate singing. Fate links thee to me for ever and a day. Which way? Which way had Christine gone? Which way would she return? Would she return? Alas, had she not declared to him that everything was finished? And was the voice not repeating, Fate links thee to me for ever and a day? To me? To whom? Then, worn out, beaten, empty-brained, he sat down on the chair which Christine had just left. Like her, he let his head fall into his hands. When he raised it, the tears were streaming down his young cheeks, real, heavy tears, like those which jealous children shed, tears that wept for a sorrow which was in no way fanciful, but which is common to all the lovers on earth, and which he expressed aloud. Who is this Eric? he said. End of chapter 9「Phantom of the Opera » by Gaston LaRue Chapter 10 – Forget the Name of the Man's Voice the day after Christine had vanished before his eyes in a sort of dazzlement that still made him doubt the evidence of his senses, Monsieur le Vicomte de Chagny called to inquire at Mama Valerius. He came upon a charming picture. Christine herself was seated by the bedside of the old lady, who was sitting up against the pillows, knitting. The pink and white had returned to the young girl's cheeks. The dark rings round her eyes had disappeared. Raoul no longer recognized the tragic face of the day before. If the veil of melancholy over those adorable features had not still appeared to the young man as the last trace of the weird drama in whose toils that mysterious child was struggling, he could have believed that Christine was not its heroine at all. She rose without showing any emotion, and offered him her hand. But Raoul's stupefaction 
was so great that he stood there dumbfounded, without a gesture, without a word. "'Well, Monsieur de Chauny, exclaimed Mama Valerius, "'don't you know our Christine? Her good genius has sent her back to us.' Mama, the girl broke in promptly, while a deep blush mantled to her eyes. I thought, Mama, that there was to be no more question of that. You know there is no such thing as the angel of music. But, child, he gave you lessons for three months. Mama, I have promised to explain everything to you one of these days, and I hope to do so, but you have promised me, until that day, to be silent and to ask me no more questions whatever. "'Provided that you promised never to leave me again. "'But have you promised that, Christine? "'Mama, all this cannot interest Monsieur de Chauny. "'On the contrary, mademoiselle,' said the young man, "'in a voice which he tried to make firm and brave, "'but which still trembled. "'Anything that concerns you interests me, "'to an extent which perhaps you will one day understand. "'I do not deny that my surprise equals my pleasure "'at finding you with your adopted mother.' and that after what happened between us yesterday, after what you said, and what I was able to guess, I hardly expected to see you here so soon. I should be the first to delight at your return, if you were not so bent on preserving a secrecy that may be fatal to you, and I have been your friend too long not to be alarmed, with Madame Valerius, at a disastrous adventure which will remain dangerous so long as we have not unravelled its threads, and of which you will certainly end by being the victim, Christine. At these words, Mama Valerius tossed about in her bed. What does this mean? she cried. Is Christine in danger? Yes, madame, said Raoul courageously, notwithstanding the signs which Christine made to him. My God! exclaimed the good, simple old woman, gasping for breath. You must tell me everything, Christine. Why did you try to reassure me? And what danger is it, Monsieur de Chauny? An impostor is abusing her good faith. Is the angel of music an impostor? She told you herself that there is no angel of music. But then what is it, in heaven's name? You will be the death of me. There is a terrible mystery around us, madame, around you, around Christine. A mystery much more to be feared than any number of ghosts or genie. Mama Valerius turned a terrified face to Christine, who had already run to her adopted mother and was holding her in her arms. Don't believe him, Mummy, don't believe him, she repeated. Then tell me that you will never leave me again, implored the widow. Christine was silent, and Raoul resumed. That is what you must promise, Christine. It is the only thing that can reassure your mother and me. We will undertake not to ask you a single question about the past, if you promise us to remain under our protection in future. That is an undertaking which I have not asked of you, and a promise which I refuse to make you, said the young girl haughtily. I am mistress of my own activities, Monsieur de Chauny. You have no right to control them, and I will beg you to desist henceforth. As to what I have done during the last fortnight, there is only one man in the world who has the right to demand an account of me, my husband. Well, I have no husband, and I never mean to marry. She threw out her hands to emphasize her words, and Raoul turned pale. Not only because of the words which he had heard, but because he had caught sight of a plain gold ring on Christine's finger. You have no husband, and yet you wear a wedding ring. He tried to seize her hand, but she swiftly drew it back. "'That's a present,' she said, blushing once more and vainly striving to hide her embarrassment. "'Christine, as you have no husband, that ring can only have been given by one who hopes to make you his wife. Why deceive us further? Why torture me still more? That ring is a promise, and that promise has been accepted.' "'That's what I said,' exclaimed the old lady. And what did she answer, madam? What I chose, said Christine, driven to exasperation. Don't you think, monsieur, that this cross-examination has lasted long enough? As far as I am concerned. Raoul was afraid to let her finish her speech. He interrupted her. 
I beg your pardon for speaking as I did, mademoiselle. You know the good intentions that make me meddle, just now, in matters which you no doubt think have nothing to do with me. But allow me to tell you what I have seen. And I have seen more than you suspect, Christine, or what I thought I saw. For to tell you the truth, I have sometimes been inclined to doubt the evidence of my eyes. Well, what did you see, sir, or think you saw? I saw your ecstasy at the sound of the voice, Christine. The voice that came from the wall, or the next room to yours. Yes, your ecstasy, and that is what makes me alarmed on your behalf. You are under a very dangerous spell, and yet it seems that you are aware of the impostor, because you say today that there is no angel of music. In that case, Christine, why did you follow him that time? Why did you stand up, with radiant features, as though you were really hearing angels? Ah, it is a very dangerous voice, Christine, for I myself, when I heard it, was so much fascinated by it that you vanished before my eyes without my seeing which way you passed. Christine, Christine, in the name of heaven, in the name of your father, who is in heaven now, and who loved you so dearly, and who loved me too, Christine, tell us, tell your benefactress and me, to whom does that voice belong? If you do, we will save you in spite of yourself. Come, Christine, the name of the man, the name of the man who had the audacity to put a ring on your finger. Monsieur de Chagny, the girl declared coldly, you shall never know. Thereupon, seeing the hostility with which her ward had addressed the vicomte, Mama Valeria suddenly took Christine's part. And if she does love that man, Monsieur le vicomte, even then it is no business of yours. Alas, madame, Raoul humbly replied, unable to restrain his tears. Alas, I believe that Christine really does love him. But it is not only that which drives me to despair. For what I am not certain of, madame, is that the man whom Christine loves is worthy of her love. It is for me to be the judge of that, monsieur, said Christine, looking Raoul angrily in the face. When a man— continued Raoul, adopt such romantic methods to entice a young girl's affections. The man must be either a villain or the girl a fool, is that it? Christine! Raoul, why do you condemn a man whom you have never seen, whom no one knows, and about whom you yourself know nothing? Yes, Christine, yes, I at least know the name that you thought to keep from me forever. The name of your angel of music, mademoiselle, is Eric. Christine at once betrayed herself. She turned white as a sheet and stammered, "'Who told you?' "'You yourself.' "'How do you mean?' "'By pitying him the other night, the night of the masked ball. When you went to your dressing-room, did you not say, "'Poor Eric?' "'Well, Christine, there was a poor Raoul who overheard you.' "'This is the second time that you have listened behind the door, Monsieur de Chagny. I was not behind the door. I was in the dressing-room, in the inner room, mademoiselle. Oh, unhappy man, moaned the girl, showing every sign of unspeakable terror. Unhappy man, do you want to be killed? Perhaps. Raoul uttered this perhaps with so much love and despair in his voice that Christine could not keep back a sob. She took his hands and looked at him with all the pure affection of which she was capable. Raoul, she said, forget the man's voice and do not even remember its name. You must never try to fathom the mystery of the man's voice. Is the mystery so very terrible? There is no more awful mystery on this earth. Swear to me that you will make no attempt to find out, she insisted. Swear to me that you will never come to my dressing-room unless I send for you. Then you promise to send for me sometimes, Christine? I promise. When? Tomorrow. Then I swear to do as you ask. He kissed her hand and went away, cursing Eric and resolving to be patient. End of chapter 10 
The Phantom of the Opera by Gaston Leroux Chapter 11 Above the Trap Doors The next day he saw her at the opera. She was still wearing the plain gold ring. She was gentle and kind to him. She talked to him of the plans which he was forming of his future, of his career. He told her that the date of the polar expedition had been put forward, and that he would leave France in three weeks, or a month at least. She suggested almost gaily that he must look upon the voyage with delight, as a stage towards his coming fame, and when he replied that fame without love was no attraction in his eyes, she treated him as a child whose sorrows were only short-lived. "'How can you speak so lightly of such serious things?' he asked. "'Perhaps we shall never see each other again. I may die during that expedition.' "'Or I,' she said simply. She no longer smiled or jested. She seemed to be thinking of some new thing that had entered her mind for the first time. Her eyes were all aglow with it. "'What are you thinking of, Christine?' "'I am thinking that we shall not see each other again.' "'And does that make you so radiant?' "'And that, in a month, we shall have to say good-bye forever. "'Unless, Christine, we pledge our faith and wait for each other forever.' She put her hand on his mouth. "'Hush, Raoul. You know there is no question of that, and we shall never be married. That is understood.' She seemed suddenly almost unable to contain an overpowering gaiety. She clapped her hands with childish glee. Raoul stared at her in amazement. "'But, but,' she continued, holding out her two hands to Raoul, or rather giving them to him, as though she had suddenly resolved to make him a present of them. "'But if we cannot be married—' We can, we can be engaged. Nobody will know but ourselves, Raoul. There have been plenty of secret marriages. Why not a secret engagement? We are engaged, dear, for a month. In a month you will go away, and I can be happy at the thought of that month all my life long. She was enchanted with her inspiration. Then she became serious again. This, she said, is a happiness that will harm no one. Raoul jumped at the idea. He bowed to Christine and said, Mademoiselle, I have the honor to ask for your hand. Why, you have both of them already, my dear betrothed. Oh, Raoul, how happy we shall be! We must play at being engaged all day long. It was the prettiest game in the world, and they enjoyed it like the children that they were. Oh, the wonderful speeches they made to each other, and the eternal vows they exchanged! They played at hearts as other children might play at ball only as it was really their two hearts that they flung to and fro, they had to be very, very handy to catch them, each time, without hurting them. One day, about a week after the game began, Raoul's heart was badly hurt, and he stopped playing and uttered these wild words. "'I shan't go to the North Pole!' Christine, who in her innocence had not dreamed of such a possibility, suddenly discovered the danger of the game, and reproached herself bitterly. She did not say a word in reply to Raoul's remark, and went straight home. This happened in the afternoon, in the singer's dressing-room, where they met every day, and where they amused themselves by dining on three biscuits, two glasses of port, and a bunch of violets. In the evening she did not sing, and he did not receive his usual letter, though they had arranged to write to each other daily during that month. The next morning he ran off to Mamma Valerius, who told him that Christine had gone away for two days. She had left at five o'clock the day before. Raoul was distracted. He hated Mamma Valerius for giving him such news as that with such stupefying calmness. He tried to sound her, but the old lady obviously knew nothing. Christine returned on the following day. She returned in triumph. She renewed her extraordinary success of the gala performance. Since the adventure of the toad, Carlotta had not been able to appear on the stage. The terror of a fresh cock filled her heart and deprived her of all her power of singing, and the theatre that had witnessed her incomprehensible disgrace had become odious to her. She contrived to cancel her contract. Daae was offered the vacant place for the time. She received thunders of applause in the juive. The vicomte, who of course was present, was the only one to suffer on hearing the thousand echoes this fresh triumph, for Christine still wore her plain gold ring. A distant voice whispered in the young man's ear, "'She is wearing the ring again to-night, and you did not give it to her. She gave her soul again to-night, and did not give it to you. If she will not tell you what she has been doing these last two days, you must go and ask Eric.' He ran behind the scenes and placed himself in her way. 
She saw him, for her eyes were looking for him. She said, "'Quick! Quick! Come!' And she dragged him to her dressing-room. Raoul at once threw himself on his knees before her. He swore that he would go, and he entreated her never again to withhold a single hour of the ideal happiness which she had promised him. She let her tears flow. They kissed like a despairing brother and sister who have been smitten with a common loss, and who meet to mourn a dead parent. Suddenly she snatched herself from the young man's soft and timid embrace, seemed to listen to something, and with a quick gesture pointed to the door. When he was on the threshold she said in a low voice that the vicomte guessed rather than heard her words, "'Tomorrow, my dear betrothed, and be happy, Raoul, I sang for you to-night.' He returned the next day, but those two days of absence had broken the charm of their delightful make-believe. They looked at each other, in the dressing-room, with their sad eyes, without exchanging a word. Raoul had to restrain himself not to cry out, "'I am jealous! I am jealous! I am jealous!' But she heard him all the same. Then she said, "'Come for a walk, dear. The air will do you good.' Raoul thought that she would propose a stroll in the country, far from that building which he detested as a prison whose jailer he could feel walking within the walls, the jailer Eric. But she took him to the stage and made him sit on the wooden curb of a well, and the doubtful peace and coolness of a first scene set for the evening's performance. On another day she wandered with him, hand in hand, along the deserted paths of a garden whose creepers had been cut out by a decorator's skilful hands. It was as though the real sky, the real flowers, the real earth were forbidden her for all time, and she condemned to breathe no other air than that of the theatre. An occasional fireman passed watching over their melancholy idol from afar, and she would drag Raoul up above the clouds in the magnificent disorder of the grid, where she loved to make him giddy by running in front of him along the frail bridges, among the thousands of ropes fastened to the pulleys, the windlasses, the rollers, in the midst of a regular forest of yards and masts. If he hesitated, she said with an adorable pout of her lips, "'You a sailor!' and then they returned to terra firma, that is to say, to some passage that led them to the little girl's dancing-school, where brats between six and ten were practising their steps, in the hope of becoming great dancers one day, covered with diamonds. Meanwhile Christine gave them sweets instead. She took him to the wardrobe and property-rooms, took him all over her empire, which was artificial, but immense, covering seventeen stories from the ground floor to the roof, and inhabited by an army of subjects. She moved among them like a popular queen, encouraging them in their labors, sitting down in the workshops, giving words of advice to the workmen whose hands hesitated to cut into the rich stuffs that were to clothe her heroes. They were inhabitants of that country who practiced every trade. There were cobblers, there were goldsmiths. All had learnt to love her, for she interested herself in all their troubles and all their little hobbies. She knew unsuspected corners that were secretly occupied by little old couples. She knocked at their door, and introduced Raoul to them as a prince charming who had asked for her hand, and the two of them, sitting on some worm-eaten property, would listen to the legends of the opera, even as in their childhood they had listened to the Breton folk-tales. Those old people remembered nothing outside the opera. They had lived there for years without number. Past managements had forgotten them. Palace revolutions had taken no notice of them. The history of France had run its course unknown to them, and nobody recollected their existence. The precious days sped in this way, and Raoul and Christine, by affecting excessive interest in outside matters, strove awkwardly to hide from each other the one thought of their hearts. One fact was certain, that Christine, who until then had shown herself the stronger of the two, suddenly became inexpressibly nervous. When on their expedition she would start running without reason, or else suddenly stop, and her hand, turning ice cold in a moment, would hold the young man back. Sometimes her eyes seemed to pursue imaginary shadows. She cried, "'This way! And this way! And this way!' laughing in a breathless laugh that often ended in tears." Then Raoul tried to speak, to question her, in spite of his promises, but even before he had worded his question she answered feverishly, "'Nothing, I swear, it's nothing.' Once when they were passing before an open trap-door on the stage, Raoul stopped over the dark cavity and said, "'You have shown me over the upper part of your empire, Christine, but there are strange stories told of the lower part. Shall we go down?' 
She caught him in her arms, as though she feared to see him disappear down the black hole, and in a trembling voice whispered, "'Never! I will not have you go there. Besides, it's not mine. Everything that is underground belongs to him.' Raoul looked her in the eyes and said roughly, "'So he lives down there, does he?' "'I never said so. Who told you a thing like that? Come away! I sometimes wonder if you are quite sane, Raoul. You always take things in such an impossible way. Come along! Come!' And she literally dragged him away, for he was obstinate and wanted to remain by the trap-door that whole attracted him. Suddenly the trap-door closed, and so quickly that they did not even see the hand that worked it, and they remained quite dazed. "'Perhaps he was there,' Raoul said at last." She shrugged her shoulders, but did not seem very easy. No, no, it was the trap-door shutters. They must do something, you know. They open and shut the trap-doors without any particular reason. It's like the door shutters. They must spend their time somehow. But suppose it were he, Christine? No, no, he has shut himself up. He's working. Oh, really, he's working, is he? Yes, he can't open and shut trap-doors and work at the same time. She shivered. What is he working at? Oh, something terrible! But it's all the better for us. When he's working at that, he sees nothing. He does not eat, drink, or breathe for days and nights at a time. He becomes a living dead man, and has no time to amuse himself with the trap-doors." She shivered again. She was still holding him in her arms. Then she sighed and said in her turn, "'Suppose it were he?' "'Are you afraid of him?' "'No. No, of course not,' she said. For all that, on the next day and the following days, Christine was careful to avoid the trap-doors. Her agitation increased as the hours passed. At last, one afternoon, she arrived very late, with her face so desperately pale and her eyes so desperately red, that Raoul resolved to go to all lengths, including that which he foreshadowed when he blurted out that he would not go on the North Pole expedition, unless she first told him the secret of the man's voice. "'Hush! Hush! In heaven's name! Suppose he heard you! You unfortunate Raoul!' And Christine's eyes stared wildly at everything around her. "'I will remove you from his power, Christine. I swear it. And you shall not think of him any more. Is it possible?' She allowed herself this doubt, which was an encouragement while dragging the young man up to the topmost floor of the theatre, far, far from the trap-doors. I shall hide you in some unknown corner of the world where he cannot come to look for you. You will be safe, and then I shall go away, as you have sworn never to marry." Christine seized Raoul's hands and squeezed them with incredible rapture. But suddenly alarmed, she turned away her head. "'Higher!' was all she said. "'Higher still!' And she dragged him up towards the summit of the building. He had a difficulty in following her. They were soon under the very roof in the maze of timber-work. They slipped through the buttresses, the rafters, the joists. They ran from beam to beam, as they might have run from tree to tree in a forest. And despite the care which she took to look behind her at every moment, she failed to see a shadow which followed her like her own shadow, which stopped when she stopped, which started again when she did, and which made no more noise than a well-conducted shadow should. As for Raoul, he saw nothing either. For when he had Christine in front of him— Nothing interested him that happened behind. End of chapter 11 The Phantom of the Opera Chapter 12 Apollo's Lyre On this way they reached the roof. Christine tripped over it as lightly as a swallow. Their eyes swept the empty space between the three domes and the triangular pediment. She breathed freely over Paris, the whole valley of which was seen at work below. She called Raoul to come quite close to her, and they walked side by side along the zinc streets in the leaden avenues. They looked at their twin shapes in the huge tanks full of stagnant water, where in the hot weather the little boys of the ballet, a score or so, learned to swim and dive. The shadow had followed behind them, clinging to their steps, and the two children little suspected its presence when they at last sat down, trustingly, under the mighty protection of Apollo, who with a great bronze gesture lifted his huge lyre to the heart of a crimson sky. It was a gorgeous spring evening. 
Clouds, which had just received their gossamer robe of gold and purple from the setting sun, drifted slowly by. And Christine said to Raoul, Soon we shall go further and faster than the clouds, to the end of the world, and then you will leave me, Raoul. But if, when the moment comes for you to take me away, I refuse to go with you, well, you must carry me off by force. Are you afraid that you will change your mind, Christine? I don't know, she said, shaking her head in an odd fashion. He is a demon, and she shivered and nestled in his arms with a moan. I am afraid now of going back to live with him, in the ground. What compels you to go back, Christine? If I do not go back to him, terrible misfortunes may happen. But I can't do it. I can't do it. I know one ought to be sorry for people who live underground, but he is too horrible. And yet the time is at hand. I have only a day left, and if I do not go, he will come and fetch me with his voice, and he will drag me with him underground, and go on his knees before me with his death's hand, and he will tell me that he loves me, and he will cry. Oh, those tears, Raoul, those tears in the two black eye-sockets of the death's head. I cannot see those tears flow again. She wrung her hands in anguish, while Raoul pressed her to his heart. No, no, you shall never again hear him tell you that he loves you. You shall not see his tears. Let us fly, Christine, let us fly at once. And he tried to drag her away, then and there, but she stopped him. No, no, she said, shaking her head sadly. Not now. It would be too cruel. Let him hear me sing to-morrow evening, and then we will go away. You must come and fetch me in my dressing-room at midnight, exactly. He will then be waiting for me in the dining-room by the lake. We shall be free, and you shall take me away. You must promise me that, Raoul, even if I refuse, for I feel that if I go back this time I shall perhaps never return. And she gave a sigh to which it seemed to her that another sigh, behind her, replied. Didn't you hear? Her teeth chattered. No, said Raoul, I heard nothing. It is too terrible, she confessed, to be always trembling like this. And yet we run no danger here. We are at home, in the sky, in the open air, in the light. The sun is flaming, and night birds cannot bear to look at the sun. I have never seen him by daylight. It must be awful. Oh, the first time I saw him, I thought he was going to die. Why? asked Raoul, really frightened at the aspect which this strange confidence was taking. Because I had seen him! This time Raoul and Christine turned round at the same time. There is someone in pain, said Raoul. Perhaps someone has been hurt. Did you hear? I can't say, Christine confessed. Even when he is not there, my ears are full of his sighs. Still, if you heard... They stood up and looked around them. They were quite alone on the immense lead roof. They sat down again, and Raoul said, Tell me how you saw him first. I had heard him for three months without seeing him. The first time I heard it I thought, as you did, that that adorable voice was singing in another room. I went out and looked everywhere. But as you know, Raoul, my dressing room is very much by itself, and I could not find the voice outside my room whereas it went on steadily inside. And it not only sang, but it spoke to me, and answered my questions, like a real man's voice, with this difference, that it was as beautiful as the voice of an angel. I had never got the angel of music whom my poor father had promised to send me as soon as he was dead. I really think that Mamma Valerius was a little bit to blame. I told her about it, and she at once said, It must be the angel, at any rate, you can do no harm by asking him. I did so, and the man's voice replied that, yes, it was the angel's voice, the voice which I was expecting and which my father had promised me. From that time onward, the voice and I became great friends. It asked to give me lessons every day. I agreed and never failed to keep the appointment which it gave me in my dressing room. You have no idea, though you have heard the voice, of what those lessons were like. No, I have no idea, said Raoul. What was your accompaniment? 
We were accompanied by a music which I do not know. It was behind the wall and wonderfully accurate. The voice seemed to understand mine exactly, to know precisely where my father had left off teaching me. In a few weeks' time I hardly knew myself when I sang. I was even frightened. It seemed to dread a sort of witchcraft behind it, but Mamma Valerius reassured me. She said that she knew I was much too simple a girl to give the devil a hold on me. My progress, by the voice's own order, was kept a secret between the voice, Mamma Valerius, and myself. It was a curious thing, but outside the dressing-room I sang with my ordinary, everyday voice, and nobody noticed anything. I did all that the voice asked. It said, Wait and see. We shall astonish Paris. And I waited, and lived on in a sort of ecstatic dream. It was then that I saw you for the first time one evening, in the house. I was so glad that I never thought of concealing my delight when I reached my dressing-room. Unfortunately, the voice was there before me, and soon noticed, by my air, that something had happened. It asked what was the matter, and I saw no reason for keeping our story secret, or concealing the place which you filled in my heart. Then the voice was silent. I called to it, but it did not reply. I begged and entreated, but in vain. I was terrified lest it had gone for good. I wish to heaven it had, dear. That night I went home in a desperate condition. I told Mamma Valerius, who said, Why, of course, the voice is jealous. And that, dear, first revealed to me that I loved you. Christine stopped and laid her head on Raoul's shoulder. They sat like that for a moment in silence, and they did not see, did not perceive the moment, at a few steps from them, of the creeping shadow of two great black wings, a shadow that came along the roof so near, so near them that it could have stifled them by closing over them. The next day, Christine continued with a sigh, I went back to my dressing-room in a very pensive frame of mind. The voice was there, spoke to me with great sadness, and told me plainly that, if I must bestow my heart on earth, there was nothing for the voice to do but to go back to heaven. And it said this with such an accent of human sorrow, that I ought then and there to have suspected and begun to believe that I was the victim of my deluded senses. But my faith in the voice, with which the memory of my father was so closely intermingled, remained undisturbed. I feared nothing so much as that I might never hear it again. I had thought about my love for you, and realized all the useless danger of it, and I did not even know if you remembered me. Whatever happened, your position in society forbade me to contemplate the possibility of ever marrying you, and I swore to the voice that you were no more than a brother to me, nor ever would be, and that my heart was incapable of any earthly love. And that, dear, was why I refused to recognize or see you when I met you on the stage or in the passages. Meanwhile, the hours during which the voice taught me were spent in divine frenzy, until at last the voice said to me, You can now, Christine Day, give to men a little of the music of heaven. I don't know how it was that Carlotta did not come to the theater that night, nor why I was called upon to sing in her stead, but I sang with a rapture I had never known before, and I felt for a moment as if my soul were leaving my body. Oh, Christine, said Raoul, my heart quivered that night at every accent of your voice. I saw the tears stream down your cheeks, and I wept with you. How could you sing, sing like that while crying? I felt myself fainting, said Christine. I closed my eyes. When I opened them, you were by my side. But the voice was there also, Raoul. I was afraid for your sake, and again I would not recognize you, and began to laugh when you reminded me that you had picked up my scarf in the sea. Alas, there is no deceiving the voice. The voice recognized you, and the voice was jealous. It said that, if I did not love you, I would not avoid you, but treat you like any other old friend. It made me scene upon scene. At last I said to the voice, That will do. I am going to Paris to-morrow, to pray on my father's grave, and I shall ask Monsieur Raoul de Chagny to go with me. Do as you please, replied the voice but I shall be at Peros too, for I am wherever you are, Christine. And if you are still worthy of me, if you have not lied to me, I will play you the resurrection of Lazarus on the stroke of midnight, on your father's tomb and on your father's violin. That, dear, 
was how I came to write you the letter that brought you to Peros. How could I have been so beguiled? How was it, when I saw the personal, the selfish point of view of the voice, that I did not suspect some impostor? Alas, I was no longer mistress of myself. I had become this thing. But, after all, cried Raoul, you soon came to know the truth. Why did you not at once rid yourself of that abominable nightmare? Know the truth, Raoul? Rid myself of that nightmare? But, my poor boy, I was not caught in the nightmare until the day when I learned the truth. Pity me, Raoul, pity me. You remember the terrible evening when Carlotta thought that she had been turned into a toad on the stage, and when the house was suddenly plunged in darkness through the chandelier crashing to the floor. There were killed and wounded that night, and the whole theater rang with terrified screams. My first thought was for you and the voice. I was at once easy where you were concerned, for I had seen you in your brother's box, and I knew that you were not in danger. But the voice had told me that it would be at the performance, and I was really afraid for it, just as if it had been an ordinary person who was capable of dying. I thought to myself, the chandelier may have come down upon the voice. I was then on the stage and was nearly running into the house to look for the voice among the killed and wounded, when I thought that if the voice was safe, it would be sure to be in my dressing-room, and I rushed to my room. The voice was not there. I locked my door, and with tears in my eyes besought it, if it were still alive, to manifest itself to me. The voice did not reply, but suddenly I heard a long, beautiful wail which I knew well. It is the plaint of Lazarus when, at the sound of the Redeemer's voice, he begins to open his eyes and see the light of day. It was the music which you and I, Raoul, heard at Peros. And then the voice began to sing the leading phrase. Come and believe in me, whoso believes in me shall live. Walk, whoso hath believed in me shall never die. I cannot tell you the effect which that music had upon me. It seemed to command me personally to come to stand up and come to it. It retreated, and I followed. Come and believe in me. I believed in it. I came. I came and... This was the extraordinary thing. My dressing-room, as I moved, seemed to lengthen out. To lengthen out? Evidently it must have been an effect of mirrors, for I had the mirror in front of me, and suddenly I was outside the room without knowing how. What? Without knowing how? Christine, Christine, you must really stop dreaming. I was not dreaming, dear. I was outside my room without knowing how. You, who saw me disappear from my room one evening, may be able to explain it, but I cannot. I can only tell you that, suddenly, there was no mirror before me, and no dressing-room. I was in a dark passage, I was frightened, and I cried out. It was quite dark, but for a faint red glimmer at a distant corner of the wall. I tried out. My voice was the only sound for the singing, and the violin had stopped. And suddenly a hand was laid on mine or rather a stone-cold, bony thing that seized my wrist and did not let go. I cried out again, an arm took me around the waist and supported me. I struggled for a little while, and then gave up the attempt. I was dragged toward the little red light, and then I saw that I was in the hands of a man wrapped in a large cloak and wearing a mask that hid his whole face. I made one last effort. My limbs stiffened. My mouth opened to scream, but a hand closed it, a hand which I felt on my lips, on my skin, a hand that smelt of death. Then I fainted away. When I opened my eyes we were still surrounded by darkness. A lantern standing on the ground showed a bubbling well. The water splashing from the well disappeared almost at once under the floor on which I was lying, with my head on the knee of the man in the black cloak and the black mask. He was bathing my temples, and his hands smelt of death. I tried to push them away, and asked, Who are you? Where is the voice? His only answer was a sigh. Suddenly a hot breath passed over my face, and I perceived a white shape beside the man's black shape in the darkness. The black shape lifted me on to the white shape. A glad neighing greeted my astounded ears, and I murmured, César! The animal quivered. Raoul, I was lying half back on a saddle, 
and I had recognized the white horse out of the profeta, which I had so often fed with sugar and sweets. I remembered that one evening there was a rumor in the theater that the horse had disappeared, and that it had been stolen by the opera ghost. I believed in the voice, but had never believed in the ghost. Now, however, I began to wonder with a shiver whether I was the ghost's prisoner.' 